Unity among the followers of God is requisite from scripture to modern day. The words of Paul to the saints in Corinth are just as valuable and needed today as they were then. We have much at our disposal to guide us toward this sacred objective. And at the core of our every effort is the Holy Ghost ready to reveal all things. I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit may teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. When I try to be unified with people, I think more about how can I incorporate what I want with what other people want as well. Because I think being unified doesn't mean always getting exactly what I want all the time because I have to compromise with other people. And then we can become more unified because we all have a common goal. I've seen unity work a lot. I play volleyball so and all sorts of different sports teams. And especially with volleyball, you, it's, you know, it's a unit. You have, to, you have to be able to work with people and everybody's different, they're different positions. And when you all work together, you can win. If you don't, then it's just, a mess on the court. In my calling in the church, I work with the youth, and so when my presidency doesn't get along or we have different opinions, it definitely makes it harder if we're not unified. And once we can kind of come together and see both sides of what we're trying to accomplish, you can see that translate to the youth, and the youth really have a better experience in the, in the activity that we're trying to present to them, and I really feel like that helps so much. Welcome everybody, my name is Ben Lomu, and I'm your host. Our gospel scholar for today is Josh Matson. Josh is a scholar of the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls and a religious educator with seminaries and institutes of religion. He and his wife, Erin, are the parents of four children and live in Saratoga Springs, Utah. Josh, welcome. It's wonderful to be here, Ben. Thank you. And next to Josh is our special guest, Dr. Jason Carroll. Dr. Carroll is the Associate Director of the Wheatley Institute and a professor in the School of Family Life at BYU. He's been the lead instructor of the marriage prep class at BYU for the last 15 years. He and his wife, Stephanie, have five children and two grandchildren. Jason, so happy to have you. Thanks, Ben. It's great to be here. And we also want to welcome our studio audience. So happy to have you all here with us. Thanks for being here. And to the viewers at home, thank you for joining us. Throughout this discussion, we'll invite you to share your experiences with us on Facebook and Instagram. For additional study and teaching resources, visit byutv.org slash comefollowup. So the two topics we're going to be discussing today come from our studies in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 7, which, as always, aligns with the Come Follow Me resource provided by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The two topics we're going to discuss are, first, the members of Christ's church strive to be united, and second, the Spirit reveals all things. We'll expound on these topics uh, and more with our panel a little later in the footnotes portion of the show. Let's get into our first topic, uh, which is the members of Christ church strive to be united. As we do this, Josh, do you mind kind of setting up this topic and what is happening contextually in the scriptures? Yeah. So one of the things that we see here, this is one of Paul's letters. 1 Corinthians uh, is contextually found in what's going on in Paul's life in Acts chapter 18. Paul is one of these missionaries who had spent time and labored and loved these people in Corinth. He's getting panicked, and so he's writing a letter back to the Corinthians saying, hey, we need to fix some of these problems that have arisen in the church, one of which is there's a lot of division. Now, one of the big things that's happening is members of the church are trying to go back to their old ways. Okay. They're going back to their old groups, their old friends. In a way, they're forming cliques. And Paul is trying to come back and say, no, 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 no. In the church of Christ, we are not divided. We need to be united. Okay. So how can we address these specific issues that are dividing you as saints? These scriptures that we'll be looking at here in this letter, while aimed at the church as a whole and can be thought about for the members, which we might apply to our relationships in wards or with other members of the church, they really do tie to marriage and family relationships, to extended family relationships, and what are the ways that Christ gave us a model to, to stay connected, unified in Him and unified with each other. From your experience, Jason, what are some of the things that you see creep in today within marriages and families that can cause division and contention? So I think the divisions often come when we start to let other things become our priority. Uh, marriages and families often then start to lose having a common part of their partnership and, and working on that together. Paul's uh, 
you know, he's beseeching them is his language there in verse 10, right? That there be no divisions and that you be perfectly joined together. One of the things that I've always do in the scriptures is when I see the word perfect or perfectly, the next word out of my mouth better be Christ. I love that. And I think it also ties into this idea of where our eyes are set. Uh, I think when your eye is set to the glory of God, right? Where is your focus? The Corinthian saints were not all the same. We know from history that many Jews were actually exported to Corinth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, by the Roman Empire from various other areas. And so they were, they were moved there. Some came from Gentile backgrounds, same, some came from Jewish backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so they, they didn't look the same. They didn't talk the same. And yet Paul is saying, we can all have the same goal. We can all have the same purpose. And that purpose is rooted in Christ. Okay. And I love how bringing that to family and viewing it as a divine institution is we can say, I can build my family and my marriage on Christ. Okay. And as I do that, that's how we will move forward, even if we disagree or we have different opinions. So with all the differences that exist in the world, polit politically, socially, religiously, how do we follow Paul's counsel to be perfectly joined in the same mind? Sarah. I like looking for the word perfect in the scriptures. You know, that was mentioned before as tying perfection to Christ and he's the only perfect being. But I've also heard that the word perfect could have been translated as complete. Okay. And so when you think of being completely joined to something, it's not that you're picking and choosing the pieces that you like or that fit into your uh, way of thinking or that are comfortable for you. You're recognizing that there is a right and a wrong. And when you're you're all in, then you're completely joined. And when everybody's all in, then you're, you're getting that unity. And Sarah, do you feel that the Holy Ghost plays a role in your ability to keep your family joined together and of the same mind? And if so, how has that helped? As a parent, I think the Holy Ghost is essential <laughs> um, because they're, they're really God's kids, right? And he's just kind of lent them to me. And without revelation, without the Spirit, sometimes I just, I don't know uh, what the right thing to say is or how to handle a situation with my kids. And so it's wonderful that I can turn to him in prayer and, um, and get those answers that my kids are looking for and also help me know what kinds of questions to ask my kids because we don't know what's going on in their lives sometimes. And having those thoughts come into your mind, you need to talk to your kid about this or you need to check on him and, and see what, you know, he's up to. Um, that's been amazing uh, as a uh, support for me and in, in my family. You know, and I imagine that this is a lot what Paul is trying to reestablish among the saints and, and just citizens in general is to try to kind of look past some of these differences and really focus, as Jason talked about earlier, on being centered on Christ, you know, to create that, that unity that can be kind of hard to establish sometimes. Yeah, and, I, and one of the things that Paul is struggling with, right, is that this isn't just a localized issue. It's not just for the saints in Corinth. Uh, it's churchwide. Uh, mm -hmm. In Acts 15, just a couple chapters earlier in Acts, we're getting that division of, should we allow Gentiles into the church? Right. <laughs> and so, uh, that we've talked about before. And so, this is a wider issue, just as we spoke about, that the divisions in our world today mm -hmm. are much wider than just our communities. When Christ appears to the Nephites, one of the first things he talks to them about is contention, yeah. right? And then, so it is, it's something that's always been emphasized by Christ and, and a key element of his church and whenever it's been established for us to have that as a central understanding part of, to be saints, right? right? What does it mean to be saints? Well, it doesn't mean perfect, right? We're striving to be complete, we're striving to be all in, um, but we're striving to be unified, right? Uh, one of the things that come to mind, uh, President Nelson, right, recently spoke in a worldwide devotional to, to all of the young adults, and he talked about identity, mm -hmm. right? And he emphasized the importance of core, right, shared identities, that that being the, the first in way that we see ourselves, because it also impacts how we see others. Yeah. First off, we're children of loving heavenly parents, right? We're children of the covenant, right? through Christ and through his atonement and through our covenants as members of the church. And that ultimately those are the primary identities mm -hmm. 
And I love that because they're shared. Of course, we all have other identities that distinguish us a bit, and those matter. They're significant and they're an important part of who each of us is. But when those become the dominant ways that we see ourselves, we start to get away from that common shared core of what is meant to be the identity that I think Paul's calling for here among the saints. Go ahead. And well, this just reminds me of the statement in the Gospels. What God hath joined together, mm -hmm. let no man tear asunder. We have a wonderful quote from one of our rotating scholars, Melissa Inouye, who talks about this. She says, the people with whom we disagree on a specific issue must be able to feel our love and response for them as people who deeply desire to be part of the body of Christ. The miracle of Zion's one heart and one mind was not that all members of the community had been born identical, but that they had chosen to love and serve each other despite or perhaps because of their diversity. So what are some things that we can do to try to better create unity among those with whom we live and work? Emery. My young women's leader said, just remember that if you ever get in an argument with somebody, people only get mad about something when it's important to them. I think that's important to remember. And that really helps when we get in like arguments at our house or like with my sister, <laughs> like just remember that people are different. And just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it's wrong. And then that can create more unity if we learn to understand and accept that. And how do you feel the Holy Ghost helps you when maybe the natural person within you wants to get upset? I think that the Holy Ghost helps me remember to take a step back for a minute and think about what I'm going to say before I say it, before I say something that I might regret that could hurt somebody's feelings. And that really helps me. Mom, do you want to comment on that, on how that's been at home, seeing this you know, happen and take place? Uh, sure. <laughs> we do have some contention occasionally, right? <laughs> it is nice to know that our kids are aware that that there are differences. When we do have contention or whatever, it's nice to know that the kids are thinking like, hey, my little sister doesn't think the same way and she doesn't have the same likes that I do, but we can still love each other mm -hmm. and we can still get along and we can try to see eye to eye on different things. And that really does create a feeling of love at our home, which is so much nicer for me as a parent. Jason, what are your thoughts? As you hear this little family talk, what are your thoughts on that? One of the mantras we use in the marriage prep class is that differences are not problems, they're opportunities. And in those moments, we get to share a unique type of love. It's great to share the love of similarity, right? That, that's fine, mm -hmm. that's great. But there's a unique type of love that when we see that someone thinks differently, enjoy something different than we have, have different preferences, and to choose something for them. Right, And I think that's true of friendships. I think that's true of parenting and our children aren't you know, the same. Uh, definitely true of marriage, but also true of our, our, our wards and, 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 and our interactions as members of the church. I think we're intentionally supposed to come together with those that are different and to cherish and, and find that. But we only do that when we don't see those as problems, but we see them as opportunities. And, and how important is it to have the spirit in those moments? Yeah. I've got twins. I have twin, identical twin daughters, 100% identical DNA, but they are so different. Right. If I respond in one way to one daughter, it's completely different for the other. And so we need that spirit to discern how do we deal with these differences because I can't act the same in every situation. Josh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 23, would you mind just kind of explaining a little bit to us uh, what it means when Paul says, and ye are Christ's and Christ is God's? Yeah, Paul is introducing this idea that ye are the temple of God mm -hmm. uh, and that the ye here is not the singular. So we're not talking you, he's talking collectively. Okay. You as a church are Christ. Why? Because you've entered into a covenant. And as Christ taught so many times that what you see me do I have seen the Father do. I'm an emulation of the Father here on earth. And so then he's flipping it and saying, so when you are trying to do things, remember that you reflect the Savior and you reflect our Heavenly Father. I feel like we could just go on forever on this. It's, there's so many good things in here. And uh, I just want to thank you both for, for helping with this first topic. The members of Christ Church strive to be united. And for the audience, thank you so much for contributing. And for each of you at home, what can you start working on today to be more unified in all of your relationships? Add your insights to the discussion on Instagram. The Spirit has spoken to me in many different ways, usually in answers to prayers, uh, where I'm faced with some challenge and, and the, the Spirit will 
guide me through those things. A lot of people have like, you know, those direct thoughts that go into their head. And for me, I just overthink everything. So that's not how it is for me. It's more of a feeling just like, oh, I should maybe do this, maybe. Or it's more just like a, like a little tickle in the back of my head, not exactly like a certain thought that comes to me. I've also received a revelation that I didn't solicit. And it, uh, I, I didn't realize I, I needed that particular you know, revelation, but I really did. And, and it touched me a lot. It, was, it came to me actually when I was asleep, came, came in a dream. And I woke up from that dream, you know, feeling the touched by the Spirit. A lot of times I feel like in this world right now, especially there's just, it feels like a really chaotic. And sometimes even in my daily life with five kids, it's really chaotic. And so for me, the Spirit is talking to me when I feel those quiet moments and I can feel peace and calm, and which is a really nice feeling. So we're now going to move on to our second topic, the Spirit reveals all things. And we're still working within these first chapters of Corinthians. Josh, do you mind giving us a little bit of context of this specific topic within Paul's letter to the saints in Corinth? Yeah, one of the things that I love is this question is really easily answered by the text itself. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 22, uh, it says this, For Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, the word for sign there um, is not just a sign like a visual sign that something's going to happen, but it's also the same word that's used in the Greek version of the Old Testament for prophecy. So okay. here we're saying the Jews require prophecy and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, so what Paul's dealing with is he's got saints that are coming from a Jewish background and saints that are coming from a Gentile background and they learned in different ways. Okay. And now he's trying to say, okay, how do I help you realize that you can't cite the prophet to the person who's a Gentile and you can't cite the philosopher to the Jew? What is the place that we can actually go for truth? And that's where Paul's going to jump in and try and give us some understanding of where we get truth. Fascinating. Well, and I think here we can have a variety of experiences, a variety of backgrounds and, and situations the Spirit can tailor to us, but can take us back to those common truths and to those common understandings that Paul wants the, the saints here to, to, to recognize and not get pulled to either of those traditions that they have in their backgrounds, but to come to the new doctrine, the new understanding of Christ, which is centered on the Holy Spirit teaching them truth. And in the second chapter, um, we have this interesting uh, dynamic where Paul talks about the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. How do we incorporate the Spirit in trying to decipher and determine with all the complexities of what the world has to offer versus what we are taught that God has to offer? Yeah. And isn't this wonderful that it's not a modern problem? I love that Paul is being vulnerable enough and saying, hey, this is something that is happening among us to help us today uh, in, that, in that crazy battle between intellect and heart that we sometimes get into. So can we go to some of these verses where Paul talks about this? And uh, Josh, would you mind reading those for us? Yeah, absolutely. So this is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, we're looking at verses 3 through 5. He says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What is the challenge of trying to make sure that our faith stands um, in the power of God as opposed to the wisdom of men? It's sometimes hard because we don't have a tangible place that we can go to um, in the sense that we can see it and we can feel it. Now, is that source there and can we receive it from God? Absolutely. But I can't go up to my friend and say, hey, I'm going to cite to you my revelation that I received three days ago from the Holy Ghost okay. and give it to you and cite my source at the bottom and say, there, now you have to accept what I received. Uh, it's much more spiritual than physical. Okay. I think part of in our day and age today, too, where people often veer from gospel truth, it isn't always a convincing of the wisdom of other perspectives. It's often a desire for the inclusion of that. Often 
uh, dialogue is very brief, it's very thin, it's pretty shallow, but there's still often a clear message of if you want to belong, if you want to be included, belonging's important, but we want to be careful that it doesn't come in uh, compromising our covenants or, or shifting in, in, in ways of just seeking that inclusion. I think what has to go with, with uh, our discipleship is, is courage. Thank you. So how can we try to decipher between the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God? Dave. The most important thing would be to be in tune with the Spirit. It can be very difficult, I think, at times to discern. And having the Spirit with us, just being in tune with the Spirit, living our lives in a way that daily we have that access and we have that uh, ability, I think is probably the most important. I like to say thank you, just not even in a prayer, just, hey, thanks, that was great. So I just kind of try to keep the lines of communication open. And um, obviously, um, reading scripture, having God in my mind throughout the day. I don't know. That sounds like it should be more complicated than that. You know, But I'm really glad that Dave brought up scriptures. We had a question come in from one of our viewers about that, and I'd love to get some of your thoughts. My name is Victoria Whistler, and I'm from Hillsborough, Oregon. As someone who struggles with autism, when I read the scriptures, it's a lot harder for me to understand deeper meanings compared to most. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul talks about how the foolish things shall confound the wise and weak things shall confound the mighty. How can people like me better understand deeper meanings when reading the scriptures? You know, my main thought for, for a question like that is just to really stay engaged with the scriptures and to do it personally, but also to talk and interact with others. And what's your thoughts? We all have that wonderful opportunity of saying, that's, that's different than I've ever mm -hmm. seen that verse. That's a different way of understanding that. But at its core, it's also seeking for the ways to let the spirit teach us. How do we focus on the big picture and, and what truth really is as opposed to small little details? Fundamentally, Christ's gospel is grounded on universal truth. So those that's what fundamentally the Spirit testifies and witnesses to. We do live in a world where we have contextual knowledge, right, of what uh, fits our time and our circumstance. But it's important not to get that confused. We can appreciate the significance of contextual knowledge okay. and learning and understanding but recognize that we have to go to spiritual revelation to get to the universal truths, which is probably where we see some stumbling, as you're saying. The Jews are, are, are at this time are turning back to their history and are trying to find it all in the, in the ancient prophecies, and the Greeks are you know, very much in this kind of learning and understanding that they've been emphasizing. You know, President Hinckley talked about our search for knowledge um, and understanding, um, you know, and, and just, from what the world offers, from what God offers. And he says, I should like to suggest that you follow that injunction given by the Son of God. With all of your learning, learn of him. With all of your study, seek knowledge of the master. That knowledge will complement in a wonderful way the secular training you receive and give a fullness to your life and character that can come in no other way. And Jason, that's exactly what you were saying, how knowledge everywhere, you know, it comes from different sources and we can use it all as long as we keep in mind that knowledge it comes from Jesus Christ. And I, and I love how this ties into the great injunction we receive in Doctrine and Covenants section 88, verse 118, to seek learning by study and also by faith. Sometimes we think simplicity can't be the answer. Sometimes we have simplicity uh, for simplicity's sake, but there's also a simplicity that comes after we've gone through complexity, okay. after we've gone through study, after we've paid a price to know something. It then becomes a little more simple for us. So sometimes, you know, I find that in our search for knowledge and our search for wisdom, it really contradicts a lot of what the world feels. So how do we find that balance between standing up for what is truth and what is right and being Christ-like and being kind with those that may have a differing opinion. That is the model of Christ, right? He was uh, uh, never uh, uh, gave in on his convictions, the commandments, wanted to be obedient in all things. 
but had tremendous patience mm-hmm. as they tried to help teach and bring along uh, all of us in our imperfections. Uh, that's what makes him the Messiah. It's a very lofty aspiration for us to strive after. We fall short all the time. Uh, I think that's a big part of where we're, we're striving to be perfectly joined as we talked earlier, mm-hmm. but a lot of that is also where we, we forgive and we seek to repair and we make things right. We do our best to avoid that, but we also recognize when it doesn't happen and Christ's grace is there too, to heal and restore us, restore relationships. Uh, but that's what we strive after if, if, if Christ is our exemplar. We have to remember that we are dealing with children of God. It's very easy to say, I'm right and you're wrong. Remember central to the plan of salvation was our ability to act. And we have to recognize that in our lives, but also in the lives of those that are around us. Okay. And so we can say, I have learned for myself that this is a truth. I've learned from the spirit that this is true. And you may not be there yet. Paul is saying that to the Corinthians. In chapter three, he actually says, I'm only giving you milk because you're not ready for meat. Mm-hmm. And so we have to have that humility and charity for others that says, okay, I'm not gonna view myself as superior to you. I'm gonna meet you where you're at. I know that this is true, but I'm gonna walk with you till you get there. Uh, Sometimes scripture robs us of that because we read scripture too quickly and we don't realize that years and decades have taken place in development. And everybody is going to have a process and sometimes it takes time. And the best thing we can do is walk with somebody on the path to that truth rather than try and push them to get there faster. So I'd love to hear from the audience, how does the Spirit help you understand truth and stand firm in that without being contentious with others? Logan. Well, I'm on the debate team in my school, so (laughs) I need to understand this because I do it a lot. The judges really like it if you are like fair to your opponent and you don't get angry and you are civil and pay attention to their points and stuff. So I feel like it's really nice for me like to be calm and like pray before I do a match against someone so that I can just keep myself calm and collected while I, you know, argue because it's really nice just to understand where they're coming from. So Logan, what would happen if you were in a conversation with somebody about how good and kind Christ is, but you were arguing and contentious within that conversation? What would the result of that conversation be, do you think? It'd be a little bit ironic because (laughs) you want to have their point of view in mind and always like be ready like to understand like what they're coming from because people aren't like you. I think differently than my brother Mm -hmm. and we get in arguments a lot. And I always try to remember where he's coming from because he's a lot different than me. You know, and I really think that's important. Thank you. The role of the spirit is to testify of truth. Right. Uh, I remember an experience I had many, many years ago uh, as a missionary, starting to learn the language, didn't know how to do it very well. And I wanted so much to share my testimony with this family. And so I, I did my best and I could see and we felt the spirit come into the room and we were all touched. And my companion turned to them and said, do you understand what my companion has said? And she said, no but I know it's true. Wow. So my companion had to reteach the principle. Wow. I did. But the spirit testified of the truth. She couldn't even fully understand the principle, but the spirit was still able to say, here's truth and you're hearing truth. And it was then able to be taught and to be explained. The spirit has that ability to connect us to those eternal truths. And when we hear them and we know them, that's how we avoid contention as well. Mm -hmm. It's not about convincing. It's not about proving a point as much as it is about loving and inviting others to have opportunities to connect to the spirit. The spirit will change hearts, which will lead to true conversion and a following of Christ. What a beautiful thought. Thank you both for everything you've shared and for the insights into the scriptures and for your experiences and for the audience as well. Thanks for being with us and for for sharing of your testimonies about our discussion today. And for those at home, how does the Spirit communicate with you? Next up is footnotes. Join us as we take a deeper dive into the scriptures with Josh and Jason. I really was grateful that I got to be here for this topic of unity because uh, that can be a difficult thing and I felt a little bit of chastisement to look for the the ways to be more unified and to um, 
look for the things that I have in common with people. One of the panelists said, you know, differences are not problems, they're opportunities. And if people in the world, especially the way the world is today, could realize that the fact that we're different is actually a benefit, that we can make so much out of it. There's so many opportunities of growth. Um, we would have a different world. I love hearing people's different opinions and seeing how they view the scriptures because sometimes they catch something that I didn't. And when you can hear that, it really opens up the scriptures more for ourselves and helps us to kind of deeper dive into them and get more um, information and, and um, you can learn more through that. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions from 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 7 with Josh and Jason. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks, Ben. Do you mind, Josh, kind of giving us uh, kind of a springboard into this discussion right now? Yeah, so both Greeks and Jews, one thing that they share is a respect for temples. Hmm. Uh, the Jewish temple that we know in Jerusalem and the, the center that that is to the Jewish lifestyle. But we also have Gentiles who had temples to their various gods. Paul's trying to say, I want to give you a visual for what you look like. And so he does this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 16. He says this as, he, as he's writing, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And so he's saying ye, as a community, are the temple of God, and you need to be united as such. I think that's fascinating, Josh, because I think uh, often we see a personal interpretation of these verses, right? Which, of course, we're supposed to liken the scriptures to ourselves, and so there's a way to think about uh, uh, that, but to think of that as a collective and that we are the temple and, and the power that comes from collecting and gathering and bearing witness and testimony and sharing in ordinances, the sacrament, and, you know, those types of things is meant to be the spiritual centerpiece of, of the saint's life. Yeah, and, and the word for temple here is interesting in our translation um, because what we see in the Greek is actually the word naos or this idea of a sanctuary. Hmm. It's where the spirit of God is supposed to dwell. It's supposed to dwell within the community. And so we need to say, if your community is gonna be united so that the spirit can dwell there with you, uh, now, individually, we still have responsibilities to that collective community, but together we need to work towards that common purpose. I think it's very appropriate, and we do need the core understanding of agency and personal accountability, personal worthiness, but this encourages us to also start thinking about it in the collective, whether that be in our marriage, our ward, our, right, that there is a collective uh, commitment to that, right? That that's where the unity is. It's not just a unity that, hey, we get along, but we have unity in following Christ so that the Spirit can be unrestrained in blessing us personally, but also blessing us collectively. I think many of us are able to uh, deepen our consecration, deepen our sacrifice, deepen our dedication when we see how much it impacts those we love yeah. and those we care about. So he's also calling them to think about each other. And that can really transform the way we think, the way we live. And then of course, as, as President Nelson's teaching us uh, all, repeatedly, to engage in daily repentance. We know that worthiness isn't a, a, a status or a, a something we achieve. It's really that journey of constant discipleship and taking a part of daily repentance to stay close to the Savior. And Jason, if I can, if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, and, and we talked about this earlier, um, this idea of being perfectly joined together. Mm -hmm. uh, one of The word here for perfectly joined together that's used by Paul um, is kartizo. Uh, and it's a word that appears in the Gospels as the word for mending nets. Okay. So you've got the exact same word that the disciples as they're on the Sea of Galilee are mending nets. And Paul is saying, I want you to be perfectly joined together. And Jason, building with what you were saying is, it's more about what's the collective trying to accomplish. And so that image of a net may have been apparent for these Corinthian saints. I've got a net and if it's got a hole in it, if there's a weak spot, I need to fix it. 
And so I go in and daily repentance, or if there's a need in a community, there's an individual that can fill that. And when you repair a net, you don't go out and find the exact same string that you use to create the net. Uh, you might just find whatever you have. Okay. So you might have a net that's green and red and purple or and brown, but it's fulfilling its purpose. Mm. And it's working towards the betterment of the community. And we all have a part to play. If there is one part of that net that is weak, the fish are gonna go out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we always see our worthiness in that light. We sometimes say, oh, no, no, like my worthiness or my body um, is about me. It's not about the collective. Right. And Paul's saying, you gotta get out of that mindset. Okay. We all depend on each other to be righteous and undefiled so that the spirit can be with us. Do you know who could really bear witness to this? Parents are anxious for their children. And, uh, you know, as my kids have gotten along in life and are moving into young adulthood and adulthood, I can go back and tell you in wards we've lived in and other things, that's the young woman's leader that we will always mm -hmm. praise. She was there at the time. My daughter needed that. That was a great primary teacher, was so good. Helped our you know, son that wasn't that enthusiastic about going to primary do that, right? And you see the way that the body of Christ comes together mm -hmm. and the collective strength of being surrounded by uh, a, a community. What that does for that sense of strength, that's the net, that's the function, right, that's there. And he's saying, you gotta think collectively here. Your commitment, your dedication, your obedience, it'll affect all of these other people that you can bless if you'll be a part of this common unity. So that, that's why all the, it's such concern about yeah. division. Yeah. The mm -hmm. division starts to pull that apart, we lose all of that beauty that's intended to be in the body of Christ. So awesome. So what are some of those things these Corinthian saints are struggling with that is causing such disunity and division? Yeah, one example that we see is in chapter four. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter four, uh, if we look at the end of verse six, uh, one of the things Paul points out is that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So you're starting to get these factions that form and individuals saying, well, I'm better than you because, okay. or I'm better than you because. And so then that kind of creates animosity, it creates jealousy, it creates this sense of hierarchy in the community, and Paul's saying, no, get rid of that. Uh, you know, the prophet Joseph Smith talked about this quite a bit as well, about the community building and the gathering of the saints. President Nelson's telling us now, the gathering of the saints, there is something about the power of gathering, the power of the spirit that is there when we unite in Christ's name, we serve one another, we get outside of ourselves, we unify for the ordinances that are a part of the gospel. The unity should extend and we should feel that and, 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 and speak highly of and, and hold up the best and the positive and work to strengthen the church in, in, in all of the, the parts of the world. You know, I, I was reading in, in just at the end of chapter three, kind of what Jason was saying, therefore let no man glory in men for all things are yours. You know, even though there are individuals that may have a calling that is more visible, sometimes we do them a little bit of a disservice when we puff them up and, and it can be very uncomfortable at times. But like what he says at the end of chapter three, ye are Christ. It's all about pointing things to the Savior to build this, to become this one body. I've seen that happen, Ben. I've seen um, times where people will be reluctant to take and receive callings that maybe are a bit visible mm -hmm. and be the young women's president, be the Relief Society president, be that what it might be. And often the concern is, how will I be viewed? Right. Will I be judged? <laughs> will I be criticized, right? We lose something really powerful there. I mean, that's that whole purpose of sustaining, mm -hmm. right? And that's more than a hand raising exercise. That's a, I sustain you for this period, for this season, you'll play this role in our community you have my support. Right. I think the problem comes, uh, and this gets into the contention and unity issue, is we gotta be really careful about getting in a pattern where we talk about people and we don't talk to people, mm -hmm. right? We're taught directly by our living prophets and by ancient prophets that if we have struggle, difficulty, or contention, 
to go straight to our brother or sister, right? Mm-hmm. To deal with it between us and to seek amends, not to spread the contention and get others involved as that happens. So I think our wards often can be sensitive. We can all ask ourselves, do we have a ward that's really good at talking to each other? Or are we no. more of a ward that talks about each other? We can change that. Yeah. We can make collective steps to make sure that we have uh, that type of church experience that people would feel confident. I can, mm-hmm. Everyone's nervous enough. I, I can take <laughs> that calling. I can do because people are going to support me. And I think that ties into these principles. And, and Jason, as you were saying that, I, I couldn't help but think you're talking about the Corinthian saints mm. because Paul's going to move on into chapter 6. Uh, one of the, the phrases that we see here comes in 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 7. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to the law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? This idea that Christ taught to turn the other cheek. Mm -hmm. You're so upset that your brother has defrauded you that you're taking them to court and saying, I'm going to ruin this relationship. I'm going to ruin this unity because of that. And so they're spreading that defilement Hmm. from one individual to other individuals in the community, which if not repented of or checked, is going to leave the whole community unable to do the purpose of them being a community, which is to be part of Christ. There's a lot about personal worthiness and and how we use our bodies. How do we help our members really grasp the importance of, you know, what these saints are struggling with and how we can really use our bodies to connect and strengthen our relationship with God? This earthly experience and our understanding of the soul being the spirit and the body helps us to start appreciating, thinking about an embodied faith, Right, that our faith is expressed, not just in what we think, not just in what we believe, those are critical and important, but ultimately what we're called upon to do and how we act and to strive through our lives. And this is the great quest of discipleship, right? Is to follow the example of Christ to bring our actions into harmony with our beliefs, Mm -hmm. right? The word of wisdom uh, ultimately starts to be not just something we commit to in mind, we commit to in body, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, modesty, not just modesty of dress, but modesty of thought, modesty of speech, right? Appropriate views of that. Again, that'll ultimately be manifest in the body. I think that's a, a, a big part of starting to capture Um, this part of what Paul's saying. And looking towards eternity, it's not just about doing the right thing. I I love what Elder Lindsay Robbins taught about the fact that our purpose in life is more about becoming something than it is about doing something. Mm. And so that's the other thing is Paul is saying, you may be doing outward things that are okay. You may be going to church. You may be doing all those. But is it really changing who you are? And that becomes manifest in your actions. And if you want to become like Christ, you have to become like him. And it's not just by going through the routines. And so how is this going to affect uh, the saints as as a whole? And what is the responsibility once we truly understand uh, where this comes from? That's where I think that principle of becoming is your real, uh, is the emphasis, right? So we've got kind of the the two ways that people slide off of this. There's the hey, my heart's in the right place, but I don't, I don't sweat the small stuff. I don't, I don't need to do all those mm-hmm. commandments. I don't need to follow all those things. We get a justification that says, hey, as long as I'm, I'm a good person, I'm kind, I'm doing, you know, eh, I don't need to follow mm-hmm. all these rules and prescriptions. Then we got the other direction. I follow all the rules and prescriptions, but are my motivations right? Are they done in, in, in charity yeah. and true love? There's a lot of motivations that can get us off. Becoming becomes where they have to come together. You can't become and emulate and be endowed to be like Christ with just the behaviors without the heart. Right. You also can't just have the heart without the behaviors, right? They've got to come together in a fullness of devotion to Christ. And I love how Paul really kind of brings that together when he says, for ye are bought with a price. Yeah. So now our charge, I love how it was exactly what you're saying about this combination of he says, so glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Yeah. Many of us at times and seasons of our life, we don't feel worthy. Mm-hmm. We don't feel valuable. We, we struggle with that to always remind ourselves, how do you know the worth of something? It's the price someone would pay for it, right? Our price has already been paid. And like you said, what a great price, what a tremendous price. 
but it was only it was paid by Christ because of a recognition of our worth, our divine potential, our deep, deep love that he has for each of us. If each one of us can hold on to that in our hearts every day, I think all the, you know, the, 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 the struggles of our sense of our own weakness, our own incompetencies, we'd have a lot to really push mm-hmm. back on the adversary with to say, wait a minute, I was bought with a price because I'm worth it. Right, And that's where it comes from. It's not our achievements, mm-hmm. our accomplishments, our degrees, our marital status. It's not any of those things. That is what fundamentally determines our worth, and it is that price that we were bought with. And, and it's fascinating that you say that because it's the ye again mm-hmm. is plural. It's y'all. It comes back to how are we viewing each other? Do we view our relationships at that great price? And again, we're back to shared attributes. These will bring unity because they don't distinguish. We all have a divine heritage. We're all, you know, beloved spirit children of heavenly parents. We all have a divine nature. We are the children of God. To recognize that in ourselves can only fully be done when we recognize it in others. If we deny it in them, we also in some ways deny it in ourselves. The atonement is intimate. It is a very personal thing between us and Christ, but it's also infinite. And it is for all, and it is collective, and we're, we're all trying to go home together. And imagine if we viewed each other like that. If we looked at people, that, especially those with whom we may disagree, on even some core principles in life, if I could say an extremely expensive price was paid for that individual, yeah. how, would I, how do I change? You know, and even, even if we even bring it in closer to home, you know, Paul talks about marriage. What if husbands and wives viewed each other as, as somebody whose worth is of such great value because of the price that was paid for them. How, what kind of effect, you know, as a marriage and family counselor, yeah, what, are you, what are your thoughts on the that? The greatest thing, right, that anyone could ever do is to hold on to that belief. I was deeply impacted years ago when I first read uh, Elder Bruce Hafen's book, Covenant Hearts. And in that book, he talks about how the parable of the good shepherd is probably the best teaching we have in scripture for how God wants us to view the marriage covenant. It talks about the difference between the shepherd and the hireling. And the Mm -hmm. shepherd, right, when the wolf comes, the hireling fleeth because it's a hireling. But I am the good shepherd and I stay. And whenever there's a time that there's discord, there's disagreement, there's distance in a relationship, the greatest thing that a spouse needs to do is to seek after a new endowment of how God sees their spouse, right? Can you please endow me with that? I know you have perfect love for my wife. I know you have perfect love for my husband. I don't have that right now, right? If you think of the divine, wow. the divine triangle, mm-hmm. right? You got your direct path to your spouse. If that one's got some static, take the long route, right? <laughs> go go, up through, go okay. up through God and come back okay. down because you know that there's perfect connection down each wow. of those. It's not to say that that's a kind of a simple solution, but no one moves in that direction without their hearts being in the right place, without the desire to work in unity, to be equal partners. That's what gets lost, but this is how it gets restored. I love what you're talking about, Jason, with husbands and wives and wanting to view each other uh, the way that God views them. But sometimes we want to force our view of who we want that person to be. Hmm. And we, we sit there and we say, no, we want you to be this. And, and Paul may have seen some of this. Uh, he uses the word unbelieving, and, and I, there are many ways that we can take that. But look at what he has to say uh, in verses uh, 13, 14, and 15 in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So this idea that there are some things that you're not gonna see eye to eye on. But if you can understand and accept those differences, then it's not enough to go your separate ways. This idea that at times you are helping to carry a spouse along the way with you, or you're the one that needs to be carried. Mm -hmm. And so I want my spouse, my wife to look at me as I want to become. So wouldn't it be just right that I would view her the same way of what she wants to become. I'd love to get some of your thoughts, Jason, on how we can take some of the things that he is teaching and look at them them contextually 
versus how they apply in modern marriages and families. Yeah, I mean, clearly this gets us into understandings of chastity Mm -hmm. and how we think about that. And particularly in our modern times where uh, our children and others are exposed to a lot of patterns that don't follow uh, the teachings of prophets and scriptures related to chastity. So our children always do better and we ourselves do better when we feel that we're standing for something rather than standing against something, right? So if the law of chastity is only understood as a list of thou shalt nots, Mm -hmm. right? And it's just behavioral, has nothing to do with the condition of my spirit, the condition of my heart, right? And just hold out till you get married. And then once you get married, you don't have to worry about chastity anymore, (laughs) right? No, 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 it's a condition of the heart. But it is, as we tie into this, some of these understandings where we start talking about, uh, what was it in Corinthians 6.13? The phrase is that the body is for the Lord, right? And then again in 20, glorify God in your body. I don't know if many of us think about and definitely teach our our rising generation chastity in those terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, The common misunderstanding is that chastity is abstinence, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's why there's this idea of a marriage finish line. That's not a proper understanding of chastity. Chastity is the proper expression of our sexual creation according to God's plan and to God's purposes. We sometimes see uh, in young couples and also not so young couples struggle in the intimate part of their marriage because they didn't feel that they were preparing for anything. This was just something to kind of a personal purity, stay away from it. And now that becomes a stumbling block in a way that isn't the pattern that was intended for marriage. So maybe it was it became so focused on the physical, not the spiritual, that you were missing that spiritual element on how it can strengthen your relationship with your spouse and with God when it's all about, oh, just wait till you get married and everything will be fine. Yeah, Elder Holland, his classic landmark address of soul symbols and sacraments, mm-hmm. right? He talks about the three core doctrines that really help us appreciate chastity. And what God intends is to create what could be called sexual wholeness. So what is sexual wholeness? If we use Elder Holland's guide, he says there's three doctrines that'll tell you what has to be unified. The doctrine of the soul, right? So the spirit and the body have to be unified. We have a culture that often reduces people to body parts Mm -hmm. and to appearance. And we talk about and judge and rate and view. That's a fragmentation. That's using a person as an object. Mm -hmm. The spirit and the body aren't unified. The next doctrine that Elder Holland talks about is the doctrine of the symbol, right? And he emphasizes that sexual union in marriage is intended to be the symbol of a complete commitment, a total commitment. It's meant to be a symbol, right? A capstone Mm -hmm. of the marriage, not a cornerstone or the foundation that it's built on. And then his last doctrine he emphasizes is the doctrine of the sacrament, right? So it's also meant to unify a couple with God. Okay. So when we teach our young people and we embrace in our own minds and hearts, chastity very much now becomes the law of chastity is a law of do's, mm-hmm. not yeah. a law of don'ts, right? That we live for. We're standing for something. We're not standing against something. And isn't that perfect wow. to talk about in 1 Corinthians? because you've started and talked about the macro community Mm -hmm. and you've Mm -hmm. said you need to be committed and you need to be part of this. But if you can't even be committed wholly on a soul symbol and sacrament level to your spouse, in your home, how are you going to be committed on a soul symbol and sacrament level to the savior and his gospel? And to even glorify God. As we do that, as we live, you have chaste hearts, chaste minds, right? And then chaste actions and relationships, we glorify God. You know, I always know it's a good study session or discussion when I'm left wanting. (laughs) And I can tell you right now, like this is gonna send me, you know, back into the scriptures to do more study. I I cannot tell you how much I appreciate uh, this conversation. It's been wonderful. Jason and Josh, thank you so much for, for being here and for just, adding so much to today's episode. And thank you for joining us at home for this discussion from the first few chapters of 1 Corinthians. I encourage you to record and act upon any impressions you've received. We also invite you to follow along with our study this year through Facebook, Instagram, and at byutv.org slash come follow up. 
Next week, we're studying 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 13, where we'll discuss the sacrament, spiritual gifts, and more. Thanks for watching.